fourth installment of this long area going through all the other gemstones, those that aren't famous particularly, but still are really important to the trade, we get to discuss tourmaline, which is a really fabulous gemstone. And those of you who were born in October, this is your stone, and you're really lucky because it comes in every color of the rainbow, and it's truly a fantastic stone that's really growing in its com commercial importance, and then also availability. It was misidentified as emerald for hundreds of years, and only in recent modern times did they actually figure out what type of mineral tourmaline is. Let's start in with the mineralogy and the geology of tourmaline as best we can here. It ends up being that tourmaline is kind of a catch-all name for a whole host of different minerals. Like 20 different minerals are all tourmalines, and they each have different chemical compositions. So what we're going to do, uh, number one, we're going to say that this is a name. Tourmaline's a name, which is okay to use, for a family of minerals. A number of those minerals are gems, and they're all related to one another with a similar crystal structure and composition. This chemical composition, we're just going to write down here that it's a complex boron bearing silicate. That would be all I would ever want you to know. Should we put down the whole chemical formula here for fun? Uh, hopefully this doesn't take long. In the first part of the lattice, it can be either it can be either one of these elements along a solid solution that occur in one spot in the lattice. So some tourmaline has calcium here, some has potassium. So we just put them all together in parentheses. In another spot in the lattice, you can have a bunch of other cations, including lithium, magnesium, and manganese. All right, so this is another example of solid solution. Any of these can replace each other to create different varieties or different colors like you see in this example here from Wikipedia. In the next spot in the lattice, it's aluminum, chromium, iron, and vanadium. And as you look at this spot in the chemical composition, you see this, and you see this, and you see this, right? And these tend to be impurities that can color tourmaline. And so maybe this is part of the control manganese is some, one of the things that does that as well. All right, and then what we have is boron, oxygen three, there's a three here, there's a six here, we're almost done. Look at this chemical formula. You would never want to memorize this chemical formula. O18, we're almost done. And then in the final spot, you can either have OH or fluorine. Oh boy, I ran out of space. There should be a little four right down there as well. So it's a very complicated chemical formula and it will crystallize in different geologic environments with the different um, compositions. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the composition reflects geology. Composition reflects geology. And of the different 20 species, there's about four of them that actually matter for both geology and gemology. Most gems are a variety of tourmaline called albite. Then there's another variety called, and we're going to, we're kind of making a table here, liticotite. Lidicotite. Then there is kind of a, another group, which is called dravite, and it goes to in solid solution with another variety called uvite, so we put those two together. And then last, there is a variety called shoral or scoral, and we're going to put parentheses garbage. The reason why shoral, scoral, both pronunciations are okay, is black, and it has heavy iron. It's very rich in iron. All right, so these are our headings to our different tables of the different types of tourmaline. We're going to put here that albite is most gems. When we see tourmaline that's faceted, most of the time it's from albite. Here, our solid solutions end up being sodium, lithium, and aluminum. Our liticotite, which can produce spectacular specimens as well, maybe more museum-grade things, has calcium, lithium, and aluminum. We see a lot of color zoning in this variety, like we saw in this heading picture here. No pictures of gemstones yet. We're going to fix that real soon. Dravite to uvite, this occurs with calcium, magnesium, and aluminum. And when, because of these different cations that occur, we can actually make some geologic controls as well. Because sodium and lithium and aluminum, these things are all enriched in pegmatites, which is the number one type of geologic occurrence for this variety of tourmaline. And same with this variety. All right, they both have lithium, so that 
makes sense. Dravite and uvite, with all this calcium, they come from metamorphic limestones. Well, metamorphic limestone, another word for that is marble. And then shoral, our garbage, this is 95% of all tourmaline in nature. Let's put that 95% in nature. You can fast at it. And during the like 1800s, people would fast at it and make it into jewelry for mourning periods after someone has died in the family. And this occurs in pegmatites and metamorphic schists and a plenty of other environments as well. So there's some of our geology and our mineralogy. The, a couple other things we usually put down here for geology and mineralogy. What number are we on? Number four. Number four, let's talk about its hardness. Well, it has to be pretty hard to be a good gemstone, and it is. It's a Mohs of seven, and there is only fracture, all right? It breaks with a conchoidal fracture like quartz does. So it doesn't break apart too readily because there's no pronounced cleavage. Our crystallography, let's see what the crystals look like here. Look at the crystallography here. It tends to form these elongate prisms with sometimes a pyramid on the top, sometimes just a pinacoid on the top. The outline in three dimensions is this rounded triangle. And if we were to draw it in cross section, what you would see is the sides of the triangle are these curved, kind of like that. And then it goes down with prisms. And they tend to be striated as well. Okay, so we're going to put that down here. We're going to say striated. striated, that was hard for me to spell, um, columns. The symmetry is threefold with a triangle. That puts us in the hexagonal system, the special variety of the hexagonal system called trigonal. So don't get confused, even though it is three-sided that you see, it is still the hexagonal system. Okay, there's our structure. We've drawn it in, fantastic. Maybe we should now move on to color, because that's one of the biggest stories about tourmaline is that every color of the rainbow it can be. Oh, there's one thing we should do before we move to colors, and that is because our crystals tend to be elongate, many of the gemstones that are fast, oh, we can't overlap, many of the gemstones that are faceted of tourmaline tend to be elongate as well. So it'd be something to expect, would be to see long columnar things like this, or someone will maybe facet a rectangle, and like this, out of what was, a really long columnar crystal. This would be how it tends to be faceted. All right, so big B under tourmaline is color and optics. We've done a lot of organization up till now, saying how there are all these different varieties that form in different geologic environments. Well, color is also highly varied as well. So let's say, let's just put here every color of rainbow, and some of those colors are more valuable than others. The most common color is green. This is the most common color, but it's not the most valuable color. The, and it's controlled by saturation and rarity and all the things you would expect in a free market. The different colors are controlled by trace elements. So let's say compositional control to color. Compositional control to color. And we could go through all of them. Um, let's just do a couple of them that are important. So when we have a lot of iron, but not too much, right? All, a lot of iron goes black. But if you have some iron and titanium, you tend to get the more um, common colors of green to greenish blues. If you have a lot of manganese in the lattice, then you get pink. You also can get reds and purples. These are very precious stones. So here's an example of a bluish green. Let's insert a gemstone. Here's an example of a pink, a beautiful pink color. These faceted gemstones are coming off of the Omi Privé website, who's a fantastic purveyor of high quality gems. Now the strongest green is called chrome tourmaline. The strong, and this is this one's worth, in terms of all the green, strongest green is named chrome tourmaline. And the thing that colors chrome tourmaline is not chrome, but it's actually vanadium, which is totally wild. People thought it was chrome at first, but then science later actually shows that it's actually vanadium. That doesn't matter too much, right? But it is an interesting little side note. And then the last type of color I would like to talk about is the most expensive tourmaline out there. It's a fairly recent discovery. It's called 
Pariba. Let's make sure I spell that right. There's an accent right here. It's after a location in Brazil where this was discovered. And people describe this as like a neon bluish green. I've heard some people say that it's like Windex blue. And so let's let's just put here neon greenish blue. Let's put parentheses Windex if you know what that is. That window cleaning material. Here is a fantastic example of Pariba tourmaline. It can be darker than this, it can be lighter, but this is color that everyone would agree is the most valuable of tourmaline today. It can be forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 just for a single carat stone. All right, so this is very expensive. And the price fluctuates some with supply. It's coming out of Brazil. Okay, what else do we want to say here? Well, the coloring agent for Parariba tourmaline is copper. And so if you're finding a fantastic blue like this, let's say in Madagascar, no, Mozambique in Africa, you can't necessarily call it Parariba because it's not coming from Brazil, but you could call it copper bearing. And so it would be equally as valuable because of that color that you want. The formation of Parariba is in pegmatites, really unusual pegmatites that are enriched in copper. And then finally, the last type of colorway to describe here is bicolor tourmaline. Many times crystals have shades of color that change, like here in our initial picture from pinks to greens. And pinks and greens are like a fruit, like a watermelon. And in fact, a lot of times bicolors are called watermelon tourmaline. Now you can have other colors switching, but watermelon is the variety that is pink to green and it's a very popular type to buy just because it's a neat sequence of color. So here's an image of an example of a faceted watermelon tourmaline going from the green to the pink colors. Now a couple other things to talk about with respect to color and optics is the pronounced pleochroism in tourmaline. Is this number five? I think this is, should be number five here. Pleochroism is very important because it is strongly pleochroic. So we should say pleochroism is important. Now what is pleochroism? You may have forgotten. It's where light goes through the crystal lattice in different amounts, in different directions. So what we could have is a tourmaline crystal. Let's draw it here. We have to draw that triangular cross section. We're gonna make it columnar vertical like this. Oh gosh, draw straight lines. And maybe, this is a green one, we'll have it be green. You could have green light come through the crystal in this direction, but because it's actually able to transmit, so let's say transmits green, but in the C axis, which is the elongated axis here, this is our C axis, well, it's so absorbent to light that it is just black. No light comes through. In this case, this is called a closed C axis, where one axis is dark to light or absorbs all the light. This makes stones less valuable and much harder to facet. So when you are faceting a tourmaline, you need to try to take advantage of this pleochroism. Maybe you could cut a stone taking advantage of your um, the way light comes through to try to get multiple colors to show up in the same stone and make it bigger or more beautiful. Why would I say bigger there? I'm, that was a little bit of a stumble. I apologize for that. Now, this lecture is getting a little long because there's just so many different types of tourmalines. Let's not say too much about the imperfections here. There are fluid inclusions. That would be the number one type of imperfection in the student. And it, easy for me to say, fluid inclusions are the primary imperfection. And the cause of this, again, is the uh, igneous magmatic pegmatite environment that is rich in fluids. There are heating effects that you can do to tourmaline. All right, so heating does some things. The primary thing that heating will do to your tourmaline, and it is completely undetectable, and we assume that many of the pinks are ended up heated because it will heating will lighten the saturation. And this is important. If you pull a green stone or a pink stone out of the ground that's too dark, then you can heat it slightly to lighten the colors 
saturation. And then, so just as our last thing to finish up, where is tourmaline coming from in the world? Well, the primary source is the same as, it seems like, so many gems, which is in Brazil. There are these fantastic pegmatite provinces in Brazil that produce tourmalines and topazes and aquamarines in great quantities. And so once again, Brazil is very important. But other places are important as well, like, um, well, Africa and Afghanistan and Pakistan. They have beautiful tourmalines in those locations. In the United States, we actually have a USA source as well. This is near San Diego, near a little town called Pala. So if you go outside of San Diego to a place called Pala, you can actually go mine as a tourist some tourmaline-bearing pegmatites, one of which, which was very famous and sent a bunch of beautiful pinks to China for dozens of years. So this would be a place I'd encourage you. If you ever get to go gem hunting or if you get to go to San Diego, go gem hunting there. All right, that'll wrap it up for tourmaline. I know it went a little long. We'll try to keep the next one a little tighter.